Uh, good afternoon, everybody. We will start the afternoon session. It's OK? <laughs> uh, let me introduce myself. I'm Hideki Goto from Toyota Motor Corporation. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm a member of the steering committee in this uh, event. And also, I'm a chair of the Jasper Next Generation High Speed Networking Working Group. <coughs> I will be your moderator in this afternoon session. Uh, we had, uh, in the afternoon, we have two sessions. Uh, one is, uh, well, the first session is uh, oh, oh, oh. safety and security, and then we will shift to validation and test. Uh, in this uh, session, we have two interesting uh, presentations. The first of the, the first uh, presentation is security protocols and applications, best friends or worst with enemies. The uh, presenter is Antonio Galeggio, and a priest has started the presentation. Thank you. So first of all, thank you for the, for the introduction. And let's see after, after the mealtime how, how we are doing now to, to speak a little bit about security. So we will uh, start speaking about security protocols and applications, how they interact with each other. Uh, this uh, presentation was prepared by several colleagues, colleagues from Technic Engineering, so the author Lars Folke, Jose Galve, and myself, Antonio Gallego. Uh, my, our, my colleagues cannot be here today, unfortunately, but I will try to do my best to explain what we have done together. So we will start uh, having a small introduction on why do we need security and what we will discuss today. We will then take a look to the security protocols that are being used nowadays in the automotive networks, of course in the onboard network. We'll try to check some points, how can we improve on future generations, and we will reach a conclusion. So let's start. So a uh, first question that a lot of people is having is why do we need security in the onboard network? This makes everything more complex. It's, it may, it makes the um, software more difficult to build, to integrate, and to um, release. But the reality is that safety is only dependable when the right security is present. What does this mean? In the last generations, we are having more and more uh, autonomous, dr autonomous driving functions, for example, which can actually control our car. The clients must trust on the car that will drive alone, autonomous, without being controlled by anybody and they must be sure that nobody can change the behavior of the car from outside. So security seems to be something that is quite uh, crucial for these scenarios and use cases. Not only that, there is a lot of new regulations appearing. Uh, one of them is the one mentioned here, the UN ECE R155, that is actually mandatory in the European Union, for example, in order to be able to sell cars since last year. There is other regulations like the ESOSI 21434 that as well take the topic of security to a next level. And we see that it's getting more and more important in the next generations. But while designing the new generations, the new architectures, the new software, we jump to a lot of questions about does security slow down the development process? Yeah, of course it does, but we will see today that we can make this a little bit easier. We have to think as well how can we do the security transparent for the application developers, and we will as well speak today about which is the conflict between applications that communicate and security. Of course, the focus today will be based on networks, 
So we will speak about network security only. So we have here um, simplified uh, software architecture. So it's actually the communication stack, very simplified. And we see that the classic um, model is based on layers. Okay? Each layer is specifically for one thing. It has a specific uh, responsibility, and we know what each of them has to do and how it will signal to the upper layers when the communication can start. We have here layers that the main, whose main um, target is actually to find of the physical channel is available. We have some that actually tell us, okay, is somebody at the other side? Which physical network, uh, physical uh, node I have on the other side? Which network do I have on the other side? And which services can I consume or send in the communication channel? And on top of everything, of course, we have the applications. Each of them signal to, signal to the next layer when it's ready to start to send packets. And now the question comes, so where should I include security? So there is several options that we will check now, and they, it can be included, of course, in any of the layers. Let's take a look, analyze what is now included in the different layers, starting with the one on top, the application layer. TLS, so the transport layer security, and DTLS for the UDP uh, traffic is present already in the IT, in the IT uh, sector since the 90s. It was created for mainly for communication between servers and uh, um, browsers and web servers. And it was created for this specific case. It was mainly created with the focus of uh, making secure the HTTP traffic. The reality is that in the car we don't use HTTP or specifically HTTPS as much as in the IT um, um, sector, but we are using TLS anyways. How do we use TLS? In order to use TLS, the applications must use, instead of standard sockets, the so-called secure sockets. And that means the um, application developers must know what a secure socket is and must configure in the application to use this one for certain type of traffic. This makes the TLS highly dependable from the application developers. In case this is not properly done, a compromised application could actually communicate unsecure, could even communicate secure, and the other node will not notice about this. There is some um, new firewalling systems and intrusion detection system and intrusion protection system that try to fight against this, but in the end is a protocol created for the internet and not so much for a local network like the onboard network of a car. But let's take a look to a specific example using the SOM IP middleware. So the SOM IP middleware can send usually over UDP or TCP. And let's start with TCP cases. In the TCP case, we will use TLS, okay? The SOM IP SD middleware was created when security was not there. So it was designed without security in mind. When we use a TCP channel, the channel must be created or established on advance. TLS will only make longer the time needed to establish the TCP channel. So it's not affecting as much. But if we think a little bit about the onboard networks, we will notice that there is much more UDP traffic than TCP traffic nowadays. That means most of the secured communication will need to use DTLS. The SOM IP middleware to use UDP will wait for the Ethernet linkup to start to transmit and receive. As soon as we get the Ethernet link up, the, the signal will trigger the, the middleware to start to send traffic over UDP. But if we think a little bit how TLS works and DTLS works, we still need to create a secure channel. We have to establish a secure channel in order to send protected data. 
That means the some IP middleware will start to send traffic over UDP, but probably this secure channel is still not established because the some IP middleware starts, wait, starts exactly after the signaling of the um, Ethernet link up. What will happen with these packets? These packets will probably get dropped internally on the ECU when we have firewheeling underneath, or they could even reach the cable not being protected. We could even accept packets which are actually not protected during this time. It's not so trivial, it seems, in the end, to um, use TLS or DTLS with some IP, for example. We would have to change the middlewares in order to wait for DTLS traffic. So let's speak about the next layer. We could actually protect the network layer. And in this case, IPsec is there as well since the 90s. Main target of this protocol was to create uh, VPNs, so we, for sure, all of us are use, used IPsec in the last months or in the last years due to corona. A lot of companies have started to use VPNs more and more. But this IPsec is a little bit more abstract for the applications. These demons that take care of establishing the IPsec channel are running usually in the operative system. It will create a tunnel and we can send traffic on top of it. How does IPsec know which is the traffic to send and which is the traffic to don't send through the tunnel? This is actually quite easy. They have the so-called secure policies, but it's in the end a rule. You will know which traffic has to go through the tunnel and which traffic will go unprotected. The applications typically does, are not aware of IPsec. We are again in the previous case. If I try to send traffic, but I'm not aware about IPsec, I will not get any signal from the stack that is telling me when the tunnel is ready. It will again be in the case that we will probably drop packets. We can see here in this layer that it's a really simplified <laughs> rule. We have the path to accept packets and the uh, path to drop them. It could happen that we start to send traffic again. Some IP, the some IP middleware, for example, will start to send traffic. The tunnel is not ready. We will drop a lot of traffic here. So it seems again <clears throat> that the applications need to be aware of security. This force again us to modify a little bit how the applications are designed to include new signaling. Another problem that IPsec would have or presents is that actually the application does not know about it, but you must know which traffic is protected and which not. We have to somehow configure the applications so we know exactly which traffic will go through the tunnel and which not. We have to somehow, could you say, give the data to the application so they know which traffic is protected and which not. So, Till now, we spoke about TLS, we spoke about IPsec, we saw that they are not so transparent in the end for the applications as, as we expected. And if we ignore these kind of things, so we don't speak here based on paperwork, we have actually experienced this already in some generations by testing it and, and working with it, things can go really wrong. Mainly in the startup time, this can be a big problem. In um, in the automotive world, we have as well these uh, requirements on startup times. So we have always the discussion. Wh how should we adapt the communication demons to communicate as fast as possible? Should we start communicating as, far as fast as possible or should we wait for the security till it's ready to communicate all the traffic? So this is a discussion that we'll check in the next slides. How can we actually make this complexity of the security hidden for the, for the upper layers and the applications? We discussed already that we could adapt the applications, but we use only till now the specific case of the SOM IP middleware. What happens with other communication that is present in the car, like network management, like diagnostics over IP, and so on? We can improve. And to do it, we propose here some of the, 
could you say, cases that we have learned during these years. The first topic that we see and we detect is that most developers are not, so application developers are not experts in secure communication. They don't need to, neither, and probably they don't want to be experts on security. We have to try to keep security abstract for them. We have to leave the application developers focus on the work that they have to do, that is to develop the application, and not so much in um, taking care of the security part. In order to make this easier, we have to avoid creating new specific APIs for security. This makes everything really complex. We have to leave, let the integrators and the communication experts or security experts worry about security. We have to try to use as much as possible standardized APIs. This is good mainly for the OEMs. Right now in Europe, for example, it's getting quite hard to find good developers. If you use standardized APIs, developers can get more information on the internet, they can get more support, they can use things that they know already from other sectors. If we use specific ones, they will have to learn everything from, from the beginning. And we have to, of course, try to create solutions that are able to work with updates on the future. We have to secure the platform, try to move the security to the lower layers and avoid keeping the security in the application layers. To keep it in the application layers complicates the updates process. Another proposal that we have here is actually to include a new protocol that is as well an IEEE standard protocol, which take most of these problems, so take care of most of these problems. This could be MAXEC. So MAXEC is able to align the Ethernet link up signal with the MAXEC ready signal. On the link up of the physical layer, the MKA, the MAXE key agreement protocol, will take care of establishing the secure channel and configuring the hardware accordingly. So with delaying only the Ethernet interfaces that will use MAXEC, we will already align MAXEC and Ethernet linkup. We have an example here. So it's a, again a simplified example of an ECU that have an Ethernet interface, physical Ethernet interface, and three different virtual interfaces. We have the max key agreement traffic that could go bill intact or untacked. And this is not protected traffic that can start to send as soon as the Ethernet interface has an Ethernet link up. We have diagnostics over IP that is in this case, in this example, linked, so attached to a Bill intact interface that does is not protected neither. And we have the SOM IP middleware that is actually attached to an interface which is MAXEC protected. These interfaces will start to send as soon as the Ethernet interface is ready. We have an Ethernet link up, we can start to send. This one will start to send as soon as the MAXEC Ethernet, virtual Ethernet interface is ready. We'll have some delay. But the both traffic, secure and unsecure, can coexist. As well, this is a protocol that is quite fast. We can establish secure channels much faster than in the case of IPsec and TLS. By using shared, so pre-shared keys configurations, we have been able to measure 40 milliseconds after Ethernet link up until the secure channel is ready to receive and transmit. This means it is so fast that any application can wait for it. How have we achieved this? We started, of course, so we have been working on tuning and playing with MAXEC since two years, more or less now. We started, of course, with the open source solutions from the IT sector, and we tried to tune it. 
On the IT, they don't have this um, so, could we say, tight startup requirements. So they can wait five, 10 seconds till the system is up and the security channel is established. But in the automotive sector, we need hundreds of, milli hundreds of milliseconds is our, uh, could we say, target for the startup time. So we started first by tuning the startup of the application itself. With the application, I mean the MKA daemon. We reached three till four milliseconds of daemon startup on free ERTOS um, devices. And then we tuned the MKA protocol itself. How did we do this? So the MKA protocol is designed for internet networks. We are working here on a local network that we know really well with the automotive use cases. In automotive, most of the times, we know who is the one that is the master or the slave. So we have fixed roles from MKA. One is the key server or the participant, because this is the second um, step that we follow. We should be sure that we have only two participants per link, so no um, so we have only two participants in each link, so this is easier. We don't have to wait for more participants to attach to the connectivity association. And in the end, we tuned a little bit as well the heartbeat time of MKA to align with the times that we usually have on automotive networks. And with this, we achieve a time that is around 30 milliseconds for, for everything. In MKA, the worst case that we measured was 17 milliseconds. As we mentioned before, MaxSec is so fast that any application can wait for it. So what's the conclusion here? We have spoke about the, that integrating the security on communication stacks can be more difficult as we thought in the beginning. We have to actually modify applications so they are able to and know the status of security. We must have a deep and right understanding of how the stack works to properly, properly adapt the different layers to the security that will affect to them. And we have seen that protecting the local network, I think this means the onboard network of a car is not as easy as we thought with TLS and IPsec. What can we do? We can hide the security for the applications. And MaxSec allows to do, a, to do this by aligning the Ethernet link-up with the security link-up. We, we have to try to avoid a special security APIs. And we have to try to create, to use something, some protocol, like for example MaxSec, that secures the platform and make the platform easier to update. If done right, application and security protocols can be friends, best friends again. We have one more thing to say today. So after all this time that we have expended, um, invested on working with MKA demons, we have um, developed our own automotive MKA demon that will go open source in late November this year, probably in the next two weeks. It will be GPL version two license, and of course for OEMs, there will be as well a commercial license for production available. It supports MKA. It is of already tuned for automotive networks with the times that we showed in the previous table. It can be um, attached to a standard APIs with the usual security suites like OpenSSL and so on. And it's available for Linux-based operating systems. So people can see that MaxSec is real and it's possible to get integrated in the automotive sector. That's everything. Thank you for the, uh, thank you for the interesting presentation. Any questions from? 
Are there any questions? Mm -hmm. Please speak your name and the affiliation first. Yes, hello. I'm uh, Pier Giorgio Beruto from Onsemi, so thank you for the presentation. Um, so I have just one comment here. I think it's a great work. However, uh, as you know, we also now are dealing with, again, with multi-drop networks where maybe securing a single uh, interface in the, in the operating system is not enough because with multi-drop networks you will have one network interface which is bound to several nodes, right? So I'm just wondering whether it would be worth adding some capabilities in this modified version of MaxEC that you are proposing to handle also this case. So I assume you would need to negotiate the keys with each node on the network. That's my assumption looking at what you presented. Mm -hmm. How do you, what do you think about this? So in the um, case of Linux-based um, uh, ECUs, it's easier because the MaxSec part is actually already integrated in the, on the kernel. The daemon that we are presenting here is only using the capabilities of the kernel to configure the files or switches. Okay. How to do this later on could be actually something that you can tune from the OEM part or from the uh, company that works with the OEM by uh, actually changing the, how the driver configures the ports. So MaxSec is port-based. You have to configure each port separately. Sure. Uh, the problem is that in this case, one port on one station will be connected to multiple ports mm -hmm. on the network. So I think this is the, the missing part, I would mm -hmm. say. This is something that we have been working around. It will be the next iteration. We wanted first to um, discuss about the point-to-point -point test scenario because the point-to-multipoint, this would need more time to start up, of course, because you have to actually uh, exchange the keys with more participants. Exactly. This is yeah. making it a little bit slower than the times that we mentioned here, but not so much in the end. OK. In the end, we have to tune the time that MKA waits for the other participants to appear. This is already supported by the 802.1x uh, standard okay. from the IEEE. But if you play with the times that they wait for the participants to appear, you can reach uh, as well good times of an, on the startup, much better than IPsec or TLS. OK, thank you. Hey, my name is Geet Modi. I'm from Texas Instruments. I have one question. Like you, like, you guys have done very good work on the Linux side. Are you looking at the other operating systems, like uh, for Autosa, what kind of latency it will have? So um, the daemon that we will do open source is only for Linux. But this daemon, actually, we have a version as well, which works over FreeRTOS, Autosar. We actually, the measurements that are here, these ones, mm -hmm. are based on a FreeRTOS free uh, device. FreeRTOS. It's not a Linux, yeah. And so um, the platform is the same for us. We, of course, made it open source with Linux because it's easier to do. It's difficult to do it for any operating system that you have. And for Autosar, in the release 2211, MaxSec will be introduced. I'm the document owner for this uh, MKA new module that will be in the classic platform. Okay. For the adaptive platform, um, MaxSec is part of the operating system. It will be a daemon running on the operating system, exactly the same as with IPsec right now. And we have a first initial version to tune a little bit how the communication between adaptive platform and the Linux is done on regards of MaxSec. In the release 2311 is planned to add more information. Okay. Okay. But the system okay. template and so on is already included in MaxSec. You can configure MaxSec in Autosar for the classic platform and for the adaptive platform. And you're expecting similar kind of uh, startup time on Autosar as well? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Any further questions? Okay, thank you. Thank you, Antonio.